I can mention. Yeah, uh, so good morning. We're going to go ahead and start on time. Uh, I have about a 20 minute introduction, and Fadlo says he about, has about two hours of slides. He has the double carousel, and he's going to be telling us a lot. So, um, some people have said in the past that uh, all politics are local. Uh, I think we know politics may start locally, but they're really a global affair. I would also say the same thing about health care and health sciences research. And I think after you hear Fadlo's comments, uh, you'll understand why I say that. It's really a pleasure to introduce Fadlo. Uh, I'm not saying that we're welcoming Fadlo back because he remains <coughs> a professor in the Department of Hematology Oncology at Emory and a member of Winship. And he's interacting with many of us uh, on a very regular, if not weekly, basis. Uh, when you think of Fadlo's legacy at Emory as the uh, chair of the Department of Hematology Oncology, as the deputy director of Winship, as the associate dean for research in the School of Medicine, I think uh, when we all are laid in the ground and we have our caps on and Fadlo will clearly have a Boston Red Sox, New England Patriots, and Boston Celtics cap on uh, when we're laid in the ground. I think Fadlo will be remembered for his mentorship. Fadlo will be remembered for his recruitment, and Fadlo will remember for the people that he brought here who shared his driving vision to improve the care of patients with cancer and to do it through research and education. I think you'll hear today that Fadlo's brought the same passion to his new roles and responsibilities at the American University of Beirut. And I'm excited to hear what Fadlo has to say. He said he's uploaded about 20 minutes of discussions on the latest developments in North Korea. So we'll hear about that uh, from last night as well. So Fadlo, welcome. Thank you very much, Wally. It's great to be back home. You know, I. Uh, Last uh, August, when I was trying, or actually last July, I was trying to convince my wife of the advantages of selling all our properties here. Not many, but I learned a thing or two from my friend of 22 years, uh, Wally Curran, who's been a good friend since February of 1996. Uh, and offloading them to buy a nice apartment in Miami about a month before the storms hit because the you don't pay the same kind of taxes in Florida that you do in Atlanta. And my wife said, you know, I think this is home for us in the US. And I think I'm very grateful to Wally and Claire Sturck and Chris Larson for convincing me not to give up my tenure at Emory. It's, a, it's been a wonderful ride and this is a fantastic institution. I snuck into the audience on uh, thanks to Judy and Catherine to see the wonderful celebration uh, of comprehensiveness at the Carter Center, and I think it was one of the most touching moments of my life. And Shirley Franklin made me alternatively want to laugh or cry, but it is true, the World Cup is more important than oncology, and this is a World Cup year. So the, the American University of Beirut is an institution that's well known to this group. I'm going to tell you what we're doing now. Uh, I'm very happy to say that we signed a probably the most sweeping MOU that either we or Emory has signed yesterday. It's very broad, but it's factored on collaborations in five areas. It, the School of Medicine, the schools of, Pub schools of Medicine, Schools of Public Health, the Winship Cancer Institute, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and the Schools of Business. And I don't think we or Emory have something so cross-cutting. So this, this really should be an opportunity to have major transformative changes. And right after this, uh, Wally and I are going to go figure out some benchmarks that we can do to make sure that the cancer centers survive. So it's wonderful to see uh, friends like Dong Shin of many, many years, so many friends and family members here. Let me talk to you about the university and maybe tell you a few things you don't know about it. And I'm going to try to stay on track and leave some time for questions and answers, even though I do have 99 slides. So the university was founded because in the uh, mid-1800s, uh, the Presbyterian missionaries had very successful efforts 
in Asia Minor and in the Levant. And they decided they wanted to found colleges, and they founded two colleges. One was Roberts College in what is now Turkey, and this became a high school in Bogosici University, and the other is the American University of Beirut. And the Presbyterian missionary sent Daniel Bliss, who's the founder of the American University of Beirut, back to the US to raise money for the founding of this university. The state of New York granted a charter in 1863, and the college opened with its first class of 16 students on December 3, 1866. In 1920, the name was changed to the American University of Beirut, and the mission became secular. So it changed from proselytizing after some fairly unsuccessful attempts to convert anyone other than people like my uh, Catholic grandfather and, and uh, other uh, Orthodox grandfather. They were just good at educating people. And Daniel Bliss said something very important. He said, we were not, not anxious to appear great, but we were anxious to lay foundations upon which greatness could be built. So they really did have this American ethos of creating opportunities so that people could be empowered by education. And he really had a profound impact. He was president of the university for 36 years. I recently welcomed back to the campus my favorite living predecessor, John Waterbury, who had greeted me by saying, I bet you can top my 10 years. And after three years as a university president, I can tell you that I roasted him by saying, you know, John, when I talked to John, I told him I'd be happy to top his 10 years. Right now, this is near the end of my third year, Bob Haddad's three years seem like plenty. So this was the pivotal moment that changed the university, it turned it away from its conversion vision to its secular vision. Edwin Lewis, the individual pictured on the left, was a university professor who lectured about, gave the commencement address, or what they called the baccalaureate address, and introduced the teachings and the work of Charles Darwin. Now, even though Lewis himself was a devout Presbyterian, Daniel Bliss and the Board of Trustees conspired to get him to resign within six months for bringing in the revolutionary ideas of Charles Darwin. After that, the entire uh, Occidental, you know, American, English, German, Dutch faculty of the institution who taught in Arabic, they were fluent in Arabic, they translated, they resigned en masse. The university had to recruit people who would teach in English. And Bliss, recognizing his mistake, decided that we're going to focus on a secular liberal arts education. And this was the single most transformative decision arguably in the history of education in the Arab world in the last two centuries. Why? Well, the university has had an extraordinary history. This is, and you'll see this very quickly, a snapshot of the members of the graduates of the United Nations from countries like Iran, Iraq, uh, uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia, who were signatures of the UN Charter uh, when it was originally written. And as uh, one of my favorite heroes, Bobby Kennedy, once said, more world leaders have been educated at the American University of Beirut than any other institution I can think of, even Harvard. There were more graduates of the American University of Beirut at the establishment of the United Nations than from any other institution. Now, the Kennedys, I think, are interesting historic character. But as I think Ned, who is himself a Harvard College graduate, just walked in, would admit, they were not especially generous about other universities. So coming from Bobby Kennedy, this is a remarkable quote. And that's the Charles Malik, who was the original drafter of the UN Charter of Human Rights. So the university has been a very, very engaged and politicized campus forever. And this is an institution whose faculty, staff, and students believe that they need to intervene to, to do good. And, you know, we have many graduates here in, in the audience who are members of the Winship family. Now, one of the most outstanding features of the university was its hospital. The hospital, which the last version was built in 1970 and was funded by US aid money, State Department money, and money from King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Uh, as I mentioned in my inaugural address, it served time and again as a war hospital during World War I, during World War II. Uh, especially during the Lebanese Civil War. But its edifice has aged, and in 2008, the trustees decided to fund a, the building of a new hospital, and I was one of the two finalists to be, for, to be dean of medicine. And I think even uh, Jim Kern and 
uh, and Wally Kern, the two Kern brothers, advised me that you know the timing was wrong. Uh, Jim Wagner, of course, said it was not a good impedance fit for me at the time. And I think that was wise. The person they chose is Muhammad Sayy, who's a worldwide, world-renowned scholar in immunology and transplantation. But the university has seven faculties of school, agriculture and food sciences, arts and sciences, the faculty of engineering that we had named after our uh, late trustee, Maroon Saman, health sciences, medicine, the Hariri School of Nursing, which this year will gain independence from the faculty of medicine for the first time in its history. It's also the oldest school of nursing in the Arab world. The Sulaiman Alayan School of Business. You have 130 programs, bachelor's, master's, MDs, and PhD, 9,100 students, and more than 66,000 alumni. Now, among other things, it is one of the world's most stunning campuses. Several of you have studied there, and several of you, like Wally, have visited it uh, at High End also. But the campus slopes into the Mediterranean. It's just a stunning uh, university. But it's unfortunately, given the urbanization of Beirut, one of only two green spaces in greater Beirut. Now, we could be singing old Lang Syne, but the world is facing some very major problems. And these are some of them. Uh, quite candidly, if you look at the problems in the world, and just looking from the perspective of the disease, I've spent more time than any other on lung cancer, you'll see that there are major pockets in the world where these diseases are epidemic. And uh, I thought this would be of interest to IMRA, that Hungary is a real hot spot for this. But <coughs> Lebanon actually has the third highest per capita Cigarette, uh, cigarette consumption in the world. And this doesn't even factor in what I'll end my talk with, which is a discussion of a new danger, which is the water pipe. So some of these problems are starting to shape themselves in the developed world, which are referred to as, the, which is referred to as the global north, and in the developing world, which is called the global south. Now, Lebanon is a medium income country. It's not a poor country, but it's a medium income country with uh, a very, very wide disparity in wealth and distribution of wealth. Now, if you study health in the Arab world, you'll see that there are real systemic challenges. First of all, there's the dual burden of disease on the society and the individual that we see everywhere. But the inequities that we see between rich and poor, between insured and uninsured, are even more manifest in countries like that. The population of the Arab world, which is, was conservatively 370 million at the time it was studied, it's now closer to 410 million, will almost double in 50 years. And 60% of the population is 35 or under, so it's a young population. More than 40% of the world's displaced individuals reside in, this, in the Arab world. And someone has said, I'm not sure they're failing states. This was an editorial in the Wall Street Journal, so much as fading states. There are so many workarounds that people don't even use the government anymore. There's a lack of environmental sustainability and lack of good public health data. So you have to understand the pro challenges with doing research there. Weak research infrastructure, low investment in research, it's 0.2% of GDP significant brain drain, the lowest rate of return of anywhere in the world. Africa, if you leave uh, sub-Saharan Africa to study and you come back, your chance of coming back after graduate education is getting close to 10%. In the Arab world, it's 4.5%. Because in many African countries, despite the challenges, and I've visited several of them in the last two years, there is a growing participation of citizens in the electoral process. You see the positive things that just happened in South Africa, among other countries. In Rwanda, I visited, just an economic miracle. Whereas the Arab world, the governments are generally run by oligarchs, with the exception right now, the only two real clear democracies, unstable as they are, are Lebanon and Tunisia. And both have their challenges. The research collaborations tend to be about a signing ceremony, a picture for the university presidents, and no depth. Evidence-based policy making is minimal. Uh, I'll talk about that with regard to tobacco in Lebanon. Complex policy making environment. You get a law passed, you get this person sign off and the local official kills the application. And the political and economic and security instability is really manifest throughout this part of the world. 
The Faculty of Medicine is the oldest in the region. It was established in 1867 of great significance. It is the second medical school in the world to adopt the four-year curriculum after Harvard. The vast majority of the faculty are trained in the US, some in Canada, 80% are American board certified. We have a class size of 90 to 95 that we project by 2030 to go up to 120 medical students. And we're doing it cautiously because Lebanon is one of the most physician oversaturated countries in the world. Pretty soon physicians will be lucky to drive cabs in Lebanon. That's why, among other things, I've been meeting with the Royal College of Physicians in England with the Minister of Health in Canada to try to see if some of our physicians from the best Lebanese medical schools, and not just on, on AUB's behalf, can train and stay in countries that have a physician shortage. Uh, we have more than 4,000 medical graduates in the US, and we have by far the oldest school of nursing in the uh, Middle East. Now, you look at research productivity, and this is an important parameter. Uh, AUB has the fourth most publications in quantity compared to much larger, much better funded institutions from Saudi Arabia or Egypt. It's the only institution other than those two countries in the top eight in, in terms of total publications. But as I've said here many times, quantity trumps quality seven days a week and twice on Sunday. So look at the research productivity by university. No university dominates its country like AUB dominates Lebanon. 50, almost 53% of all publications, 63% of all citations come from this one small university. And beyond Lebanon, the productivity of the Faculty of Medicine in the last decade has doubled. The total publications per faculty, now part of that is recruitment, but part of that is citations per, per uh, paper and, and quality faculty. So this is actually a very good statistic, and I've shown similar data I think to the trustees at Emory a couple of years ago, describing the period from 2007, 2006 through 2016, Emory dramatically increased its research productivity by investing in stellar young scientists. And AUB is now attempting to continue to do the same thing. They've been doing this since before I came there, but we've increased the research budget from $2 million to $5.2 million. Think of how small that is compared to an American university. And yet, on average, the average paper produced by our faculty of medicine has almost 10 citations. So the only good thing we get from New US News and World Report, a, an institution I've derided for my entire time in Atlanta ever since arriving here and finding out that uh, in 2002, Emory didn't even rank in the top 200 of cancer programs. And, Thanks to Wally and all of you, it's now solidly in the top 25 to 50. But we know that Winship is better than that. AUB was awarded the number one uh, ranking in percentage of total publications in the top 10%. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the clusters of basic science research there, because it, it's been my positions as, a, as an alumnus and as a uh, donor to AUB that it's critical to invest in the basic sciences. I think most of you saw that was the thrust of our um, agenda when I was briefly a research dean here. But we have foci of real strength in oncoprotein degradation, targeting of hematologic malignancies, in genetic diseases, mostly neurological diseases that are hereditary because of the high degree of consanguinity in Lebanon, cardiovascular and renal research uh, strengths, and immunology strengths because the dean is an immunologist his wife, Sammy, is one of the world, uh, world's top uh, multiple sclerosis researchers, also an immunolo immunologist and neurologist. So I'm going to blow through these just to show you the quality of the research. This is work being done in our faculty of medicine on uh, B-type natriuretic factor, where they're selecting a, developing a very sensitive platform from biomedical engineering and the heart failure unit, because believe it or not, heart failure is among the leading causes of death in Lebanon, not just MIs, but heart failure from generally hypertension and, and uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is developing a, a, an ability to detect this early through blood monitoring. We have some very nice fundamental scientists in our faculty of arts and sciences. This is Mike Osta's work he published in Science a couple of years ago. as a paper in review at Nature, and he looks at protein uh, he, he looks at a complex 
set of proteases that control mosquito immune response to malaria. Malaria is not endemic in Lebanon. Of course, it's endemic in Africa, but mosquitoes are endemic to Lebanon. And he's interested in finding out why there isn't more malaria. What are the factors that help protect against that? Um, we have the Department of Ophthalmology, which has the most highly cited paper in the last decade in the Middle East uh, among all Arab countries. Uh, has a collaboration with biomedical engineering and electrical engineering to look at degenerative disorders of the, of the sensory retina. Many of you know macular degeneration is probably the leading cause of, of blindness among older folks. And this is a platform that's being developed that we're hoping to commercialize. Now, one of the challenges there has been developing a, an innovation park and I'm trying to get 100 different investors, I, not so much donors, but investors to put in 500,000 each to develop an innovation platform at the university to, to translate these. And uh, Dr. Fu, who we've asked to, to co-chair our International Advisory Committee, will be helping me hopefully convince folks to invest. This is a specific genomic marker for hepatitis B that's been developed by our faculty of medicine and uh, medicine, faculties of medicine and engineering. This is a probe that basically can integrate the assay into a portable smartphone device that I met with the governor of the Central Bank of Lebanon to see if we can get some angel seed funding because he gave 300 million in financial, financial backing to the banks and they're extraordinarily conservative. So I said, how about putting some pressure on these banks to invest? And I'm gonna show you some of the work that's being done uh, and name some, but not all of my stars. This is Hassan, Beibou Hassan is a fellow who's two years ahead of me in high school, always a wonderful pediatrician. Uh, in, in, for the interest of uh, conflict disclosure, he's also the, been the pediatrician for our kids for every trip we go back to Lebanon. But he is a world-class ID guy. He's actually senior author, two papers in the New England Journal. Uh, this one is about development of vaccine prevention for mild and moderately severe influenza in children. So he led this worldwide uh, trial in Lebanon. This is the largest randomized control study on the efficacy of influenza vaccine in children. And it shows that the vaccine is effective in three quarters of people. This is Samia Khouri. She's our third most cited scientist at the university. She's our vice dean for research for the medical school, uh, tenured professor at Harvard who came back. Of course, it helped that we had her husband already as the dean. But Samia uh, and Hala Darwish, who's an extraordinary nurse, authored the major paper on the impact of vitamin D replacement on cognition and multiple sclerosis, a, a positive study. Uh, this is Rosemary Bustani, who's a one woman uh, storm. Rosie was a tenured professor at Duke, came back in the mid 1990s. She's developed a major clinic for children with autism and special needs. She actually donated a large amount of land so that it could be a, a planned living facility for children with autism and other diseases. She wrote a definitive review on lysosomal storage diseases in Nature Reviews Neurology and really is one of the most ferocious advocates. She raised, Wally would be proud of this, three quarters of a million dollars at the fundraiser for special kids. So this is the cancer center and I need to talk a little bit about a cancer and I thought it would be worth putting it into context. If you look at the Arab world, and I gave a series of unanticipated lectures at the latest uh, International Association of Study of Lung Cancer in the Middle East, you'll see that the countries in the Middle East have different leading cancers. Lung cancer is the leading cause of death and the most frequent cancer in Algeria and Jordan. But in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia, it's fourth, it's actually sixth in Oman, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, Lebanon, it's second. Uh, so it's it really Algeria and Jordan, it's first. But you look at the variety of diseases and the factors, smoking is variable in, in, in the Arab world because some of the countries are so poor, the cigarette companies don't bother to market yet. They're developing marketing platforms. On the other hand, you have schistosomiasis and other diseases in Egypt. Now, breast cancer sweeps. It's the leading cancer in, among women in all the Arab countries. And there is a conscious effort, including by Naji al-Sahir, who's a 
friend of many people, to increase breast cancer awareness and therefore screening and reduce mortality. Uh, I think 14 years ago, we reached an agreement, uh, and this is one board I've never been able to get off of, to fund the Naif K. Basile Cancer Institute. This is named after a former uh, charter member of the St. Jude's Board who decided to invest in cancer care in Lebanon. He gave an initial $6 million uh, gift. We renovated the clinic and we've had three directors, Fadi Gira, well known to many of us, a good friend of Wally's and mine and others, then Hassan al-Sulh, and now Ali Tahir, who actually is an adjunct faculty at Emory. This is all three, so it's been very important to have continuity and good relations. We've actually focused on more diversity, so we've insisted on including more women. The initial faculty was all male. We have three young uh, women assistant professors. One just got promoted to associate. Don't tell her, but I signed her paperwork last week before coming here. So it's been very interesting to see how to develop a cancer center in the uh, developing world. The cancer treatment has, in, uh, has involved marketing, multidisciplinary care, in, uh, developing an inpatient unit. Last year they did 120 transplants including 50 aloes with extraordinary results. A radiotherapy unit which I think is outstanding but the equipment is antiquated, no proton yet. And palliative care, we launched our first palliative care program last November and that's really thriving. I like to think of the Cancer Center family as literally a family. So it's nurses, students, uh, therapists, faculty, staff, and this has grown exponentially. If I'd taken this picture even six years ago when I and the board, and we're only three people on the board used to visit, it would have been a quarter of, of this number of people. Uh, we've had educational collaborations. This is Najee Sahir receiving an award for awareness, for breast cancer awareness. Uh, the first award they've given of this sort in the Arab world, and he's done an extraordinary job. He's the person who brought Best of ASCO to, to Lebanon and to the Middle East. We have a major collaboration with the King Hussein Cancer Center in Jordan. Uh, this is the uh, Princess Rida in the middle, uh, all of us looking solemn, trying to not smile too much, but we have a multi-million dollar collaboration with the King Hussein Cancer Center on care paths. This is Ali Tahir. I think he's Fouad's original mentor before he met Jean Khoury, one of the world's preeminent thalassemia clinical researchers. He just published a definitive review of thalassemia in The Lancet. He has more than 300 papers. He will get tenure this year. Uh, you can tell him. I'm pretty sure he knows that. This is Ali Bazarbashi. He is our associate dean for basic research. He single-handedly set up the bone marrow transplant unit I think Ned and Amy, you would be very impressed with their results on aloes. He was a, vi he was a visiting professor here a few years ago, uh, as published in the New England Journal and Blood and, and Journal of Experimental Medicine. He's focused on work right now with uh, NPM1, with nucleophosphamin1 uh, mutations, around a third of uh, AML cases. So he's expanded his work from T-cell uh, leukemias and from virally driven leukemias. Miguel Aboud is, uh, is the chair of pediatrics, was the founding director of the only St. Jude's in the uh, Middle East. He also published a paper in the New England Journal. This was a large multinational trial on sickle cell disease. It's, I think a friend of Jim Ekman's and uh, of many of ours for years. Now the other thing I think it's important to note is, as I told you, it's a very political faculty. And our chief of trauma surgery is actually in Gaza now, suturing wounds after this uh, latest insanity that's going on. But we actually have probably the best state of the art trauma division uh, you know, in, in the Arab world and certainly the only one that's as good as the best that Israel or the West has to offer. And this was a very favorable article written by the Wall Street Journal on the quality of humanitarian assistance. Our group has actually developed the ability to link via video with, uh, with sites having excessive trauma care uh, volume and complexity in Africa, in South America, in the Middle East, 
and they do about 120 cases a month for specialized care. This is something I'm proud of. So some of you may remember Arafat Hijazi, who came here, I think, in 2008 or 2009, spent a month in the clinic with Nabil and Ram and Dong and, uh, and Tofiq as we converted him from a breast medical oncologist to a head and neck medical oncologist. He became a full professor a year ago. He's head of the fellowship program. But this is a first-in-man trial that FDA approved for an accelerated path to uh, approval that will be run out of AUB. And I think, uh, I believe Ram will be the Emory PI, and we have an MD Anderson PI, but AUB will be the principal site. And this is a phase two trial of a novel compound that helps overcome resistance to pembrolizumab. It's a $1.5 million budget. What's most striking is that investigator-initiated trials have almost completely gone out of vogue if you look at the studies. So this is a remarkable achievement. Uh, he, did, he wrote this, designed this, got it funded, lobbied multiple pharmaceutical companies, and this will go live this, uh, this fall. Uh, we also have a major, major focus on interdisciplinary education. The SHARP program is a program funded by the Fogarty Center. We got a grant, a four-year grant under Ghada al-Hajj for almost 900,000. This trains people after the MD or after residency and fellowship to become clinical investigators. It's a very successful model. Some of the trainees have gone on to faculty positions at University of Chicago, at Hopkins and other institutions. And this might be someone, something for those interested to consider participating in. We're currently in the process of renewing this grant. Uh, people, there's also a certificate program and, a, and the master's program. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Faculty of Health Sciences for the next 15 minutes because this is a unique entity. Founded in 1954, this is by far the preeminent policy-driven, impactful faculty of public health in the entire Middle East, arguably in that entire region. Uh, they focus on under-resourced countries in what they call the Global South. They have grants from the Ford Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, the Arab Fund, and they helped lead a $27 million grant from the MasterCard Foundation to educate the leaders of tomorrow in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Middle East. This is that grant, um, which after I made a visit to the uh, headquarters of MasterCard went from being 18 to 27 million to include education for Syrian refugees and Lebanese and Palestinian and Iraqis. Um, this basically takes academically promising people from all over the world. They have to be financially disadvantaged. They have a community engagement and, and, uh, and, and substantial leadership training. And they have to complete a project in addition to their school of, of uh, completing their schoolwork. But the idea here is to train the leaders of tomorrow in society, and particularly in societal health. And we had our first cadre uh, of kids from Sub-Saharan Africa a few years ago, and one of the most moving things I've seen put on YouTube was one of our kids from uh, Uganda, when they got accepted, the entire neighborhood, almost the whole village lining up to, to, to cheer them getting into AUB. But they've also been extraordinarily productive. They lead two Lancet commissions, one on Palestine, one on Syria. They publish the definitive book on public health in the Arab world. Uh, and I'm going to show you some of that scholarship in a minute. So you've got to look at our role. And our role is as leaders in preventing non-communicable diseases. 23% of all global death is linked to the environment. And 12 years earlier onset of cardiovascular disease in the Middle East is not completely explainable by smoking. There is a lack of healthy living in most countries, not Lebanon. I'll, I'll show you that surprising data. We have more than 20 professors, all of them from top universities in the US, Canada, and Europe. And the, the goals have been extraordinary. The development of urinary biomarkers for cardiovascular disease and progress towards legislation to get screening done for multiple diseases. In fact, the Dean of Public Health, when he was an assistant professor, did an epidemiologic study that linked the neurological and psychiatric deficits in child laborers with their exposure to lead and got a ban in Lebanon from their using certain types of paint. So that's having real impact. 
Also, we have a major role in nutrition. We have one of the top agriculture and food sciences schools. We have major uh, work on enrichment of white pita. You're not supposed to eat white pita to quite the same excess with phosphate to reduce postprandial glycemia, uh, glycemia and improve results in maternal care. We've got uh, work by Ammar Olabi, who's the associate dean, on integrating uh, diff changing nutrition to regulate hormones and food acceptability to improve the epidemiology of, of, of diabetes. The Middle East has an extraordinary rate of diabetes in pre-diabetic conditions, particularly in the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar. So this is also a group that now we've signed an agreement with the Ministry of, health, of Public Health for Lebanon to drive the national research agenda in a thoughtful way to tackle the problems, whether it's obesity or smoking or otherwise, to look at the drivers. What are the socioeconomic and lifestyle drivers? Can we modify diet? And how do we tackle the problem? Education, uh, empowerment, uh, and, and other means. So this is particularly relevant because of some of the things I'm going to show you about the refugee and displacement crisis. So every member uh, of our faculty is aware of the refugee challenges. Lebanon currently has the highest per capita number of refugees. Lebanon has 4.1 million citizens, as I was telling my friend Jack Arbizer yesterday. They have two million refugees. One third of the inhabitants of the country are refugees. That's why when David Cameron made his brave and generous offer to accept 10,000 Syrian refugees by 2020, he was met with some derision both in academia and in the Middle East. So think of 10,000 Syrian refugees to almost 60,000 Brits versus 60 million Brits versus one third. And so even our landscape architects are working to design schools and to improve the environment in these, in these extraordinarily uh, difficult circumstances. But doing that, we're not ignoring our own community. We've developed an award-winning university of seniors, recognizing that attachment to our university is extraordinarily intense so that people can continue their education when they come off faculty. And this has been something that we see as exporting to other universities and other communities. Now, to integrate health and design for older adults is not easy because uh, the, one of the surprisingly positive things in Lebanon is Lebanon has a life expectancy equivalent to that of the US. I'm gonna say that again because it's hard to believe. Life expectancy in Lebanon is similar to the US despite a much higher smoking rate, much worse pollution, perhaps more stress. 30% of the population under the age of 70 has symptoms of serious depression or anxiety, but people live longer. Why do they live longer? Because there is a sense of community, and yet the idea here is to develop a healthier community for the older adults and keep them engaged in society. So this is looking at outdoor built environments, green roofs, landscapes, at the same time trying to take those lessons and apply them to the biggest challenge since World War II, which is displacement. So the goals of our refugee health program are to learn from everything we're doing at AUB, to create a resource hub, establish a platform, and devise clinical and health system tools that can uh, raise awareness and build capacity. And build capacity internally. You want to train young Syrian refugees to take care of their own folks. And we have some, some health, um, I'm gonna call them health depots, not home depots, out in the Bikah training people. So this is right now what I think is one of the world's most daunting problems, and I'm not sure how to use this. Is this the pointer? Yeah. So Syria is a country of 20 million. Half of the population is displaced, and if you consider internal displacement, it's 60%. 60% of people live outside their homes. And the Syrian government recently decreed that unless you return to register your home within 30 days, the state would appropriate that. There's also continued escape from Iraq. Iraq is metastable. Uh, without being too political, I'm not sure that the popular election of Muqtada al-Sadr, who's a 
renowned critic of the United States will help that stability all that much. So where do people go from Syria? From Iraq, they mostly go to Syria. 50,000 50, have gone on to Lebanon. The majority goes to Jordan. From Syria, they go to Lebanon, Turkey, or Jordan, or they flee to Egypt. Why is this a global challenge? Because you know Lebanon is this tiny country, unstable democracy, call it what, or metastable, as some of us like to say. But this can also be seen as the dam. When this shatters, Europe is here. And Europe, uh, the continent which has bequeathed humankind the worst wars in our history, World War I, World War II, the Hundred Day uh, War, is not quite as stable as they like to think. So it's very important to develop some win-wins for these folks before they go home. We have a large grant with the University College London to build job capacity in the camps to train people. And as Wally and, uh, and Hyam and a few close friends know, the last three years we've lobbied Congress for a program to educate the Syrian refugees. And thanks to Senator Lindsey Graham, we're going to get $8 million this year specifically for that purpose without touching the prior US assistance for Lebanon and for the Palestinian refugees. It's very important that they get a win that is not out of someone else's pie. So we do all sorts of research on health. We're not just actively engaged. We have the Lancet Syria Commission, the resi looking at the resilience of health systems, child labor, and other aspects. But this is really a human tragedy. There are 19 million displaced people in the MENA region, 40% of the world's displaced. And if you look at this study on child labor and agriculture done by our faculty, this is interviews with female caretakers and details on almost 4,400 working children. And the data are stunning. 72% of the children ages 5 to 18 work in the agriculture sector in the Bika in rain, cold, and heat. 50% of the children don't go to school because they have to go to work. Lebanon has absorbed about almost a quarter of a million school-age children. Some of their parents keep them out because they need the income. School-age children in the, into the public schools, that is. There's also been the discovery of a new bacteria by one of our faculty, Iraqi Bacter, looking at the social science, the clinical epidemiology, and the laboratory. This has been a large funded uh, study that actually resulted in a very fascinating book by Omar Dawashi, the principal discoverer, a medical anthropologist, and our faculty of public health about how this came to be. This is a, a bug that in many respects uh, as according to Dr. Rice, is far worse than MRSA. There are strains out there that are resistant to virtually every antibiotic, and this is becoming more and more prevalent in the Iraqi, uh, among the Iraqi refugees, and it's spreading to the Syrian refugees uh, community as they interact. So we've gotten a number of large grants, including from the Medical Research Council for the UK. I know Fogarty's reviewing a major application. And the field sites include Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria, dozen, uh, dozen researchers from multiple institutions. Uh, these are some additional uh, grants, and this is the first meeting of the group. And you'll recognize some of these universities, such as University of Cambridge, uh, Imperial College, London, Beers 8, and AUB. So these are the kinds of things we work on, and not sparing the Yemen health crisis. Yemen is a human tragedy that has been ongoing for some time. Uh, the few of you who are interested in Middle Eastern politics will remember that Yemen was ultimately the undoing of Nasser as much as anyone else. He invaded it and basically drained his what little budget he had in there. But this is a remarkably beautiful but stubborn country that refuses external governance. Currently, Saudi Arabia and Iran are embroiled in a proxy war, which has resulted in a million suspected cholera cases. So we have projects there from the Wellcome Trust and others. We have faculty on the ground in Yemen. And we recently transported a young woman who applied for AUB, didn't have her GREs because guess what? They're not administering the GREs in war-torn Yemen. We had her flown to AUB, trade, got her a coach, uh, and she did quite well in her GREs and her education is being fully paid for by her mentor, which is Donna Shalala. Some of you might have heard of a 
recipient of an honorary degree and just an amazing lady. So these are some of the grants we're working on in Yemen. Uh, so we're working at the two extremes of obesity and starvation. We've got major global health programs. And going back to diabetes, which I mentioned earlier, the adult population in Saudi Arabia, 30, almost 36% obesity, and in the Emirates, almost 34%. Look at the diabetes rates. The highest in the world, 20% diabetes in the Emirates, 17% in Saudi Arabia. Nauru has 78.5% obesity, but they don't get diabetes. Tonga, 56%, 13%. So there is something, not just environmental, but potentially genetic in the populations. So this is an obesity prevention program that we rolled out locally and we're hoping to import into those uh, places that are saturated. Um, as the folks who work at Grady know, I became quite pleased, thanks to Ruth O'Regan, with using EPIC. And we signed an agreement with EPIC. We go live on November the 3rd, when I'm supposed to be here at Ram and Tofik's um, Atlanta Lung Program. We'll see. They're telling me they don't need me. We're hitting all the cues. But on top of that, we're collaborating with EPIC to develop a program which actually tracks refugee health parameters electronically. And now that we've sorted out the patent rights, I think this will be a very happy collaboration. Um, this is one of our mobile health platforms in the Baqa at the refugee camps. And in addition to that, we just got a large grant on, uh, from the National Institute for Health Research on fragility. Fragility of states, where I gave the keynote lecture at a recent meeting in the Amsterdam, sponsored by the Queen of the Netherlands. I never knew the Netherlands had a queen, but we got to meet her. But this looks at how do you stabilize uh, fragile states, and fragile states include Lebanon, Turkey. I would argue in the last couple of years it could even include the United States, unfortunately. So how do we put this all together? Sorry, I had to get something in there. So there's so much talent and there's such a sense of mission. But at every academic institution, you have the challenge of silos. You have the medical school, you have the School of Public Health. I showed you work from the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences, Arts and Sciences, Nutrition, uh, Nursing. And uh, at my inauguration, I said, I propose an initiative that'll take us beyond the region's medical centers. We, we have the best medical center in the region to become the region's first legitimate health sciences center. We set a, a, a platform for a vision 2025 that I have to roll out to the Board of Trustees by um, this September. That's an ambitious timeline. And the idea is how do we bridge all the challenges with interfaculty uh, collaboration? For two years, we've put out about $400,000 a year in challenge grants for people to collaborate. To put that in perspective, who wants to guess what the average startup is for a faculty member at AUB outside the Faculty of Arts and Sciences? Who wants to guess? Jonathan? $5,000. It's a startup for someone who's lab-based. So we've increased that to 10,000 we put out these challenge grants. And the idea is that in addition to physical infrastructure, we just opened our ambulatory care center will eventually develop a new medical complex that will result by 2030 in a health sciences complex on the upper and medical campus that will have public health, medicine, nursing, hopefully pharmaceutical sciences, and on the lower campus, data sciences, physics, chemistry, discovery, and, uh, and high throughput uh, and engineering. And to do this, uh, this is one of the reasons I'm here. Of course, I'm principally here for my son's graduation, but Claire was very kind to agree to sign the MOU between Emory and AUB uh, yesterday. And we're picking 32 international partners. Emory was always at the top of our list. In the United States, so far, we've partnered in a major way with Emory, Johns Hopkins, and the Graduate Center in New York. We have a small and, and enlarging uh, collaboration with Stanford on design and we have one in its infancy with Columbia. I think this is going well enough that Yale has been pushing for this and we're saying not yet, you're getting in line. So I, I want to say that I'm very proud of our relationship with Emory. We have um, to partner with the 
local institutions with the University of Saint-Joseph, the Jesuit institution, the second best university in Lebanon, and the public institution, because as you've heard me say before, a rising tide should lift all boats, as John Kennedy once said. So we also have to help lift the quality of academic work in the Arab world, so we have some regional collaborations we're working on. And for me, you've seen this slide before, and I show it for a different purpose today. I've gotten a lot of credit here, more than I deserve. But you haven't seen this slide. This is me, age seven, okay? Since age seven, my father had been preparing me to go into the medical profession, and with my mother ingraining in me the sense that I was extraordinarily fortunate. And nowhere was I more fortunate than in my 13 years here. And when you are fortunate, I think it is incumbent on you to give back to others. And so this is one of the ways we're giving back to others. One, by not getting demented too soon. Uh, this is from our 25th anniversary in Corfu, and I swear by this paper in the Japanese equivalent of the National Enquirer, Lemia hates this picture, but I think this is fairly solid research that men can put off dementia or maybe avoid it altogether by marrying more intelligent women. And you need this to put some things in context. So look at the increase in life expectancy in Lebanon. This is incredible. This is 1992 year and a half post-war to 2015. Lebanon goes from median life expectancy of 71 all the way to 78. Look at some other countries. Jordan, far more stable. Turkey, much wealthier. They go up, but their life expectancy is almost a decade less. And the Middle East and North Africa is improving. Why is this country doing so well? How's it doing this? These are four health surveys. Who knows what the US spends what percent of its massive GDP does the U.S. spend on health? 17%. Lebanon has actually reduced it, Jack, from 13% to 8.1%. And yet, 31st, U.S. is 32nd in The Economist. 32nd, the U.S. is 34th. 34th, the U.S. is 33rd. And 37th, the U.S. is 35. In four different surveys of life expectancy of health. Now, part of it is that the Ministry of Health delivers a, a very careful platform. But part of, part of it is the Mediterranean diet. Part of it is the sense that people have to be vigorous and you can't sit still. Uh, unlike what happens in the Gulf countries, you have to move around from job to job. It's, life is a constant traffic jam, so you're actually better off walking 30 minutes to your next appointment than waiting for the car service. But it may not be sustainable, and I'm going to show you why in my last few minutes, and I'm going to focus on the bad guys. For me, these are the bad guys, not industry. They have to increase the cost of drugs, but I would argue that this is a massive increase in less than 40 years, a three log fold increase. But also look at the burden of cancer in the developing world and death, and you see where China is going. China is an extraordinary economy, a controlled economy that is still going to be undercut by massive cigarette and other consumption. And yet in the US, we've done a very good job. Ever since the Surgeon General's report of 1965, adults were now down to under 15% of adult smoke. And after the cigarette companies convinced folks, kids, that it was cool to smoke in the 80s and 90s, that's cut down now uh, significantly. But if you look at age standardized prevalence of tobacco smoking among persons aged 15 and older, you'll see that the Lebanon in particular, Turkey, Jordan, Israel going up. Israel start to come down recently a little bit. But look at the global cigarette consumption by WHO region. This is just remarkable. It's the disproportionate increase in the number of cigarettes smoked in China means that China will have 30 to 35% of the world's lung cancers by 2030. And there are other threats to global tobacco control. Uh, we've gotten up front, Ram and I, crusading against e-cigarettes. I think the CDC data has backed that while they are a useful tool for smoking cessation in active smokers, they're a gateway to cigarettes in teens and in never smokers. And on top of the e-cigarettes, you have the phenomenon of the increasingly cool and even more dangerous water pipe, or argili. This is the hookah that you see more and more frequently being smoked at hookah cafes all over 
Decatur, you see them in San Antonio, you see them in Brooklyn. This is a major threat and 70% of Jordanian girls and boys, and I have similar data for Lebanon, have tried the hookah at least once by age 18, 70%. We uh, set out a platform to develop a tobacco-free campus. Uh, this year, our commencement speaker is Howard Coe, the man who, as commissioner for health for the state of Massachusetts, made all public places in Massachusetts smoke-free, uh, then did yeoman work as assistant secretary of health and human services for the US. So we've made the tobacco fairly quickly tobacco-free, not the most popular move among students, you called me the very embodiment of 21st century colonialism. I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, but look at this and look at these young folks and you think of the risk. There are 16 Web of Science articles of which are highly cited about electronic nicotine delivery systems. Half of them are from AUB. We have large NIH FDA grant and series of R01s and other grants. This is led by our Dean of the Maroon Saman Faculty of Engineering and Architecture, uh, Alan Shahadi. We're, we've been designated by the WHO as the world leader in water, spot, water pipe smoke research. We've shown that water pipes uh, show exposure to large doses of carcinogens and heavy metals, and that in an hour, a water pipe smoker can generate as much of these carcinogens as up to 10 cigarette smokers over the same time. So this is an extraordinarily effective, toxic, and dangerous system. A few years ago, and we're talking about the challenge of, of applying policy where there are multiple stakeholders, Lebanon, through AUB's advocacy and research, passed a national smoking prevention law for public places. But over the Christmas holidays, the Minister of Health, himself a pawn of big tobacco, decided to give a holiday over the big holidays. A holiday from what? From making public places smoking free. And now, four years later, that has not been restored. So we felt we needed to lead from the front. Only 16% of the world's population are protected by comprehensive national smoke-free laws. And as of less than two years ago, there were 1,800 or just under 1,800 smoke-free campuses in the US around only two thirds are fully tobacco free. So we decided to make our campus completely tobacco free by August 31, 2018. You can't smoke, you can't inhale, you can't say you didn't inhale, you can't chew tobacco. And this has a series of carrots and sticks. People who are smokers and quit smoking uh, will see not just subsidized smoking cessation, AIDS, but also a drop in the cost of their subsidized health insurance. So to conclude, you know, life and science are full of surprises. For the first time this year, we're ranked as the top university in the Arab world. I think the trustees themselves were surprised. I can say this without arrogance, we were not. I think our impact in the Arab world is expanding. We've got given four scholarships away in Sudan and in the Ivory Coast to native citizens to come to AUB working with the business communities. I hope that by the time we get kicked out, because university presidents usually get kicked out no matter how you, you wrap it up, uh, we'll have more than 100 kids from some of the most underdeveloped countries in the world attending AUB free of charge. Um, no one said this would be easy. Zaha Hadid, the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize in architecture, and our alumnus once said, if you want an easy life, don't be an architect but you know that, you're cancer researchers and doctors. So I, I do think this is the time to really partner. This is my last slide. Emory is clearly a leading research university in the US, although sometimes it seems embarrassed to say that, which irritated me no end when I was here. I think we are one of the leading high impact research and academic institutions in the global south, not just in the Arab world. We're right in the heart of a conflict ridden region you're in one of the most peaceful neighborhoods in the world. But you're in an America that's undergoing major changes at a rate perhaps no one anticipated a decade ago. I think our vision and Emory's vision are very conducive to major collaborations. All of us here want to make a difference. All of us here want to serve those less fortunate. So I think in this 
post-conflict era, in this anti-globalization era, this partnership can really make a difference. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. Do I have time for one or two quick questions, if there are any? Barry. I saw that my personal favorite cantor, Ed Neck Cantor, was not in the top ten of any Middle Eastern country. They must not be having sex, or they, and they don't drink much. So the cofactors for developing head and neck cancer, alcohol and HPV, um, I suspect there's just as much infidelity as everywhere else, but smoking rates are very high in Lebanon. But even in Lebanon, we're not seeing a ton of head and neck cancer. Um, so I was, it was a surprise to me. Ned. So I think it's safe to say Lebanon is not just the most emancipated society in the Middle East. Despite our ineffectual uh, parliament, they recently passed laws against child marriage and uh, the abhorrent law that exists in many Arab countries that if a woman agrees to marry her rapist, then they drop the charges. That was torn up only in Lebanon and Jordan so far, and I think in Tunisia. Yep, I know. I see Amy shaking her head, but believe it or not. so. Lebanon's secular lifestyle and the cigarette consumption rate probably contributes to that, as does the extent of pollution. Um, one of the challenges with Lebanon is that, like the Arab world, a lot of families, very conservative, refuse to say they have cancer. And lung cancer is a disease where early diagnosis can have an extraordinary difference. So we're trying to roll out more of a public health campaign on low-cost CT scanners. And the scan in Lebanon can cost under, under $100, believe it or not. So we're trying to get that done. By the way, I would have been disappointed if you didn't ask me a question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 